Good morning. Welcome to the third day of the Pennsylvania Literary Festival here at the Uniontown Mall in lovely Fayette County. It is a beautiful day today. We've had a really great weekend weather-wise and also with participation. Uh, we've had over 50 authors signing their books and meeting the public. We've had readings, children's activities, workshops that are going on, and there's still more today. From 12 to 5, you can still come up and uh, meet anyone that you want. Uh, we're going to have uh, another episode of Going Live later on today as well. It's going to be taped right here on the stage, and you'll be able to see that on uh, Channel 77 on Atlantic Broadband. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors. We've had so many wonderful sponsors for this event. Um, our novelist sponsorships, Albert Gallatin, Emeticis, Home Care and Hospice, Coordinated 360, The Everly Foundation, Lady Luck Casino, Nemecolon, Pennsylvania Institute of Health and Technology, West Virginia Junior College, and our Speed Reader sponsors, Burnett Oil Company, Craig Appliance, CRH Catering Company Incorporated, DeMarco's Bistry and Cantina, Duke Energy, Ellie Mae's Catering, Fayette Chamber of Commerce, First Federal Savings and Loan of Greene County, Friends of the Carnegie Free Library and Cafe Carnegie, Higginbottom Law Offices, Mark IV Office Supply and Printing, Paul Fink Funeral Home, Penn Writers, Scott C's Auto Cells Incorporated, Seton Hill University Office of Graduate and Adult Studies and Seton Hill University WPF Alumni, Waddell and Reed and El Patron Restaurant and Grill. Our technology sponsors, Linda Arnold and TSI Touch. A special thanks to all of our volunteers and our staff who have been running this. And we're going to have a closing ceremony at the end of the event today, and you're going to get to meet a lot more of the people who are involved in bringing this to us. But right now, we're going to continue with our wonderful author readings. This has been one of the highlights for me during the uh, entire festival. And this morning, we're going to start off with Carol Waterhouse. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Carol before she comes up and reads from her wonderful book. She's a professor of creative writing at California University of Pennsylvania. That was my undergraduate alma mater. And she has an MFA in fiction writing from the University of Pittsburgh, a PhD in 20th century literature from Ohio University. And she's the author of three novels, The Tapestry Baby, which is what you'll be reading from this morning, um, Without Wings, and Winsome's Delight. She also has a short story collection called The Paradise Ranch. And now, without further ado, Carol Waterhouse. Thank you. As Heidi mentioned, I'm going to read from a novel, The Tapestry Baby, which is a relatively experimental work. <laughs> it's okay. The novel uh, tells the story of eight different characters, and as a child, I was always interested in the game of gossip, where you would whisper a line into someone's ear, and they would whisper it to someone else, and you'd see the different variations that would come out. So I wanted to write a novel that took that same format. So the story is passed from character to character, offering their own unique versions. The section I'm going to read today focuses on a high school piano teacher named Ned, who is a uh, very self-conscious, very introverted person, and he is dealing with budget cuts at his, um, at his high school, uh, which makes it impossible to get the piano that is gradually falling apart uh, repaired. Uh, when he plays the piano, he likes to conjure up versions of, or visions rather, of the perfect woman. Um, and so this is where we're sort of starting here. I knew when we hired you, we were getting a man of real talent. If anyone can work around it, you are the one. But no one can. His voice sounded weak, even to himself. The principal's laugh, on the other hand, was strong and robust. Well, you know the key word around here, budget, budget, budget. The principal stood, and Ned did the same. Then the hand that had slapped him on the back reappeared at waist level, where it gently guided him out the door. But when Ned reached the hallway, he didn't move just stood there listening to the rising echoes of the screams and laughter of the students. He felt a sudden urge to cry out, adding his frustrated voice to theirs. 
He turned and stared at the principal sign on the door that had just slammed shut behind him, remembered looking at it for the first time 12 years ago when he waited for his interview. A temporary job, just to get him through music school. And then he'd stayed. The comforts his salary offered were small, but there. Slowly, the compositions he started creating, and then just dreamed of creating, disappeared altogether until the music he heard most often was the sound of cracked plaster falling from the ceiling and the high-pitched clang of the radiator pipes as the, cool, as the school slowly continued to deteriorate in both body and spirit. Budget cuts. It was the reason they had given him four months earlier not to repair the one key on the piano that had broken before the Christmas concert. What they were saying now, the two more had followed suit. No matter that his biggest event, the spring pageant, was just three months away. What difference can three little notes make? What difference, since no one ever comes, was what the principal probably really wanted to say. And it didn't help that what crowd there had been were swept off their feet at the Christmas concert, a true standing ovation, despite the one missing key that had plagued him at that time, middle C. He had actually managed to arrange around it. He told himself even its name suggested all that was mediocre in life, convinced himself that pauses would be more effective. And the ovation. He was certain it was real, not just the result of all those tired backsides squeezed into stiff auditorium chairs. Ten full rows of hands, all clapping, keeping him there a moment longer, refusing to let him go. Even Rita McAllister, who had called him up angrily the week before, her daughter, Danielle, overlooked for one of the lead parts, had been there in the front row, tears rolling from her eyes. His inspiration had a name, Dorothy. He let the syllables sing across his tongue. She was the only reason he'd been able to do it. It had all come as a result of her daisy-like skin, hair that stuck out in gentle wisps like a smoked halo that perpetually surrounded her head. She was there every moment he played, her hands lifting his fingers, leading them lightly across the keys. He would play arpeggio after arpeggio, working his way down the keys, extending the pause at the end ever so slightly while he imagined her sweet lips against his. And then his moment of brilliance, extending the pause just half a second longer, raising a slight O oh of anticipation within the audience as he kept his head toward in Dorothy's direction. It was a heavenly pause, one that raised his playing to a spiritual level. The one missing note had, oddly enough, added to the music, its absence lending a soulful sound, a sense of longing and mystery, like two hands reaching out to one another but never quite joining. Two notes had been workable, bringing it all back to the point of even. But three notes were too much. Three notes were erasing her, taking the smoke rings of her hair and quietly blowing them away. That's what enabled him to bolster up enough courage to go back into the principal's office, seat himself in the chair while absently rolling his necktie up and down on his finger the words for what he wanted to say coming no easier than the missing notes on the piano. I'm losing her. The principal leaned forward with his elbows on the desk, gave the appearance for the first time that he might actually be listening. Losing whom? Ned heard the emphasis in those words, that oom syllable, booming, creating a hopelessly low harmony sound to which his words of melody just wouldn't come. But while he couldn't voice the real reason, he clearly had to say something. Even the most artful use of spaces and silences wasn't going to get him out of this one. It's the flats. They've all been lost. He didn't intend it to make any sense, just had to say something to get out. But the principal nodded his head as though he finally understood, looked out the window as though he too could see the lost notes making their way across the distance. Ned took the moment to escape from the office, went into the silent auditorium, and opened the keys to the piano. A round of applause filled the room, just as it always did, 
a replay of the standing ovation that had taken up permanent residence in this room, filling up the cracks in the floors, illuminating the darker corners ever since the night of the Christmas concert. He didn't bow like he sometimes did. Instead, just gave a sad nod of his head and sat down. He played one note and then another, his hands filling up the keys. Dorothy was there for a moment, even offered a smile, as though she saw what had been happening over these last few weeks. He played on, each note he skipped adding a new wrinkle to her skin, converting the satiny threads of her fine dress into a skirt and sweater made of overwashed wool. A cracked button dislodged itself from her blouse. Another quickly followed. Then the whole image seemed to droop. The heels of her shoes, flats now, became run over, the stockings sagged. And there she was, the transformation complete. He hit the last note hard, two thuds of a D minor chord, and the image stood before him, its lines more solid, more clearly defined than anything he had created before. He looked into her gray, washed out eyes, gazed at her thin, colorless lips. There was nothing wisp-like about her, just a general brown haze that seemed to cover her from head to toe. His heart beat out the sound, yes, 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 its steady rhythm tapping away any other feelings that had been there before, erasing that other image entirely from his soul. And then he recognized her, the new love of his life. His heart was beating in pans for the dowdiest of librarians, Mrs. Brown. Um, in the next chapter, the story picks up from Mrs. Brown, and we find that she is not at all the uh, uh, emotionless, kind of um, a colorless uh, figure at all. She actually has a very sordid and interesting past. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. And very interesting, threading the stories from one person to another in through the collection. Yeah. I like that. Now it's time for the fishbowl question. Which do you prefer to read, e-book or print? So her question was, which do you prefer to read, e-book or print? I'm old school, I suppose, <laughs> um, which is just part of my nature, but I love the feel of a book in my hand, and um, I don't think I'm ever entirely going to warm up to e-books, even though they are convenient. Um, I took, I've taken some classes in uh, book arts, and so I love 